Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome all of you to Pediatric Grand Rounds. And um, I'm going to turn it over to our Vice Chair for Education, Dr. Sundrain Van Shake, to introduce our speaker today. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's a, a great pleasure to welcome. <laughs> I am so sorry about that. I don't think that's our speaker for today, is it, Sandra? It is not. Um, give me one moment. <laughs> sorry, folks. We're, we're just need a second. <laughs> the pleasures of working from home. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Curtis Augusta. He is a clinical professor in the UCSF Department of Neurological Surgery and chair of the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland Department of Surgery. He's actually graduated from the UCSF School of Medicine. He completed a residency in neurosurgery at UCSF and a fellowship in pediatric neurosurgery at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto and then came back to UCSF to be on faculty uh, and has been on the faculty here since 2008. In addition to a busy surgical practice, he conducts research focused on epilepsy and neuronal migration disorders. His CV has a long list of publications related to this field, as well as multiple awards and recognitions. He's a member of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons and Congress of Neurological Surgeons. And when I asked him how he decided to become a, a neurosurgeon, he said it's a prerequisite to get into the um, training program to answer that he decided that in the womb. Um, but then on further reflection, he admitted that actually it was uh, during undergraduate stu uh, studies and he took a year off after undergraduate work to work in neuroscience uh, and then uh, met neurosurgeons and realized he had met his uh, destination. And uh, with that introduction, I'm going to give it over to Dr. Uh, uh, August so that he can present his work. Well, um, thank you for such a wonderful uh, introduction, especially letting the dogs out for my, for my talk. That's amazing. What a great omen it is. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for tuning in. So I, I'm going to be focusing <clears throat> on some of the the changes that I've seen in, I've been here now for 12 years, and it's, it's funny how, uh, how rapidly things are evolving um, and innovations are really playing a role in my practice. Um, and I, I'm gonna be focusing um, largely on, on the, the changes that I've seen since I started here in 2008. Um, and I have some, some goals for the, uh, for the talk. I'll, I'll review with you now. Let's see if I can, uh... there we go. So I'm hoping by the end that together we can differentiate among the many uh, various imaging modalities that we use right now for seizure focused localization. I'm uh, interested in showing you how we are using more and more minimally invasive techniques to both diagnose and treat seizure foci. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to share some of the work that we're doing with some of the advanced imaging uh, for pre-op planning, um, for fellow resident medical student training, um, and, and probably the most fun part, the, uh, the patient engagement part of, of epilepsy. Um, and I, I wanna show you how some of these new uh, techniques and tools are, are bridging the gaps um, in our ability to communicate all this complex information to the most important uh, members of the team, the families and the, and the patients. Um, so here are my disclosures. Um, I wanna start though with a little bit of review uh, because there are very common questions that come up and I'm sure you feel them um, as these patients and families have their first seizures. Um, and I just thought it would be good to review some of the, the, the nuts and bolts of childhood epilepsy. So a very common question that we get when a, a child first has a, a seizure or a set of seizures is, uh, what's the likelihood that this is gonna be a lifelong thing? And so if you look at all comers, if you look at all the kids who seize, about a third of them will enter remission in that very first year of being treated. Um, so that's, that's pretty good. And if you fast forward, till the end of their childhood, about two thirds of them will achieve terminal remission. And of that two thirds, 86% of that will be off of meds completely. So this will just be a bad memory, no meds. Um, uh, it's, it truly was childhood epilepsy. So when we're starting to think about what I do and, and, and the patients that I see, we're really focusing on that 19% of, of kids who are seizing and resistant from the very beginning. Um, and of the kids who um, 
are, are terminally in remission, um, but remain on medications, that 14%, and, and maybe some of those medications carry with them some unwanted side effects. So th those are the populations that we end up thinking about um, uh, pursuing something more than just medications. So another common qu uh, question we get is, all right, well, I've been on one medicine or my child's been on one medicine, but they're still seizing. And so should we just keep trying one more med? So this is a big study from the New England Journal that showed for that, that population of uh, patients who first get treated with that first drug, about 53% of them will be still having seizures after that first drug. So they move on to the next drug, and then that number changes from 53% to 40%. And then they go to the third drug, and now we're looking at 36%. So you can actually see the trend of diminishing returns of we're getting 47% of the patients, then 13, then four, diminishing returns with each med. So when we think about um, uh, who is actually medically refractory, um, we consider it to be patients who have tried unsuccessfully uh, a monotherapy, at least two of those, or had one trial of polytherapy. Um, and it's important to note that if you look at the per year uh, seizure control rates, and we try to get at least six months of seizure-free freedom. And anything short of that is, is really not really great quality of life. Even, even six months is kind of tough. Only about 5% of, of patients per year will even achieve that six-month seizure-free period. Uh, and so that's not great. So once we're past these, these criteria, we're starting to very seriously consider, are there any epilepsy surgery options for these patients? So we're moving now into this category of uh, patients who are medically refractory, the meds aren't doing their job, and we have to think about surgery. And the very big question then becomes, where? Where are the seizures coming from? And it's not just a matter of where the seizures are coming from, because that's where the bad brain is. Um, what if that seizure focus is near something good or eloquent cortex? So we want to know where the bad is. We want to know where the good is. So this question of where, we need to employ different tools to answer that question. So the first tier, which is just mandatory now, would be an EEG and a high-resolution MRI. And those are answering the question of where are the seizures? Um, and ideally, if we have a high-resolution MRI, if there are any structural lesions, we can see those too. So we're really, we're, we're looking and focusing on the bad brain here. Um, second tier investigations, things that we tend to see more in, in level three and level four epilepsy centers, quaternary care facilities like UCSF, um, include tests like PET scans, SPECT scans, fMRIs, MEGs. Um, I'm not going to go into ex extreme detail about all of these. Um, the, the PETs and the SPECTs are looking for the seizure foci. The fMRI is looking for function or good brain. Um, and then the MEG is a, is a, a technique to look for both uh, simultaneously. Um, just a couple of words about some of this first tier stuff, the video EEG. If we admit a patient for a video EEG, it's usually about three to seven days. We may wean their meds. We may sleep deprive them. It's very patient dependent. Um, it really depends on what, what is it going to take to provoke that, that seizure. And it, and it really needs to be one of their typical seizures. And what we're hoping to capture is how does this seizure manifest? What is that seizure semiology? Because we're detectives and all of these details are data points. They are clues to solve the mystery of where are these seizures coming from? And what we're hoping to achieve with at least a video EEG is ideally at least lateralizing the problem, but um, um, if we can get even more um, regional information and localize where the seizures are coming from, it's much more helpful. We still have a long way to go to decide uh, how, to, how to design a surgery based on that information, but now we're starting to cone down into uh, where is the, is, the, is the problem. So to perform a truly comprehensive evaluation, again, something that you would tend to see more in a level four center, someplace like UCSF, uh, we would include, if a patient will participate, neuropsychologic testing. And what that will provide us is a baseline to see where their strengths and weaknesses are, any deficits that they may already have. Uh, it will predict which patients will tolerate surgery and, and or mapping. Um, and it will serve as a baseline. Um, what did we start with? And what do we hope to improve on and show improvements with after surgery post-op? If a seizure focus or an area of interest is close to or actually even involving language centers, well, we're going to need to start to map those centers. And the gold standards for, these, uh, for this kind of mapping would include a test called the WADA test, where uh, a, a drug called amitol is injected into the carotid, and it puts to sleep sequentially halves of the brain to at least determine which, which side of your brain is dominant for speech. We can also uh, begin to answer the question of where is speech with functional tests like a functional MRI and an MEG, 
and I want to talk a little bit about those two individually. These are non-invasive tests with multiple trials now that have demonstrated their efficacy. Um, they may give a uh, very precise localization of those um, functional uh, areas of tissue in addition to lateralization. The problem is that um, it, it's not quite so um, uh, specific. And we, you know, it's not enough to just say that this area is involved. How necessary is it? That doesn't really help us determine how safe would it be to be uh, operating close to that area or, resect, or even resecting parts of those tissue. These tests won't give you that kind of granular detail. Um, this is an example of an fMRI. So these are patients who are actually performing tasks in the scanner and areas of metabolic activity start lighting up in the scanner and we can actually label them in these pretty vivid colors on the actual slices of the MRI. And so on the left hand side of the screen, you can see two dimensional slices. And of course, if you, if you have a stack of two dimensional slices, you can then organize them into three dimensional structures. And now you're starting to talk about um, how we're gonna visualize these things for surgery because and put yourself in the position of, a, of a, an epilepsy surgeon, you have to start thinking about how am I gonna actually perform a surgery? And, and that includes things like positioning and, 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 and exposure. Um, it's very, very helpful uh, to think about surgery, which is a very three-dimensional task in three-dimensional terms. So uh, being able to reconfigure these into 3D is very, very helpful. Um, so this is an example of that on the right. The MEG is another kind of functional test where we are uh, using um, the fact that when neurons fire, there's a distortion of a magnetic field around those neurons. And we use these little devices called squigs in the MEG scanner to detect those magnetic field distortions. And so using these distortions, we can start to map the brain for things like motor function, sensory function, auditory and visual function. Um, the language function mapping continues to improve. Um, I, st I still wouldn't put it in the category of like gold standard for sure, but getting better and better to map language. Uh, we can also co-localize um, where EEG spikes are happening on, during the same study. So I'll show you some examples of where we're getting a lot of this mapping information and we're putting it on the same pictures of where the seizures are coming from. So co-localization is possible. And all these pretty pictures can be loaded onto a, an, an MRI that we will bring to us to the operating room for neuro navigation. And I'll show you an example of that. So here's some motor mapping done in an MEG scanner. This is a patient's right hand and palm down, palm up. We're gonna ask them to move their index finger so that will fire the first dorsal interosseous muscle, the FDI. Um, we can ask them to then palm up and move their pinky finger. It'll fire the abductor digiti minimi. And these points of firing uh, will distort the magnetic fields in the appropriate cortex, light up on a squid. And now we can label the brain to where those appropriate areas are. Um, this is an example of co-localizing that functional information. This is a somatosensory evoked field or sensation co cortex. And then on the other side of the brain, we can actually label where the spikes are. So this is becoming more and more visual. Again, you, the surgeon, have to take all, synthesize all of this two-dimensional flat imaging and create three-dimensional structures. So this is a, a, a nice tool, an adjunct to what we do in the operating room. So this is a picture of neuronavigation. All those pretty pictures I showed you before that we've organized into 2D and 3D slices are showing up on this TV screen here. And there are basically very tall computer computers that have cameras on them that see a wand that we use during surgery. And this wand will show up on the screen, the MRI screen. So we'll know where we are at all times with respect to that critical where information, where are the seizures foci, where is the eloquent cortex. We're constantly checking where we are. It's kind of like GPS for brain surgery. Um, so this really helps us custom customize incisions, craniotomies. It helps us monitor our progress as we're as we're working our way through brain tissue. Um, so neuronavigation is 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 basically st standard fare for for brain surgery today. So um, let's now move into how the field of um, seizure localization has been evolving. And again, we're still asking the question of where. Um, so imagine you have a patient um, who had an MRI and it didn't show any big brain tumors or lesions that are, are just smoking guns. And, and, but we know uh, based on all the other, other information that we've got, video EEGs, um, SPECT scans and so forth, that there's something going on in a certain part of the brain. So we have it uh, localized. We call that non-lesional epilepsy. It's, it, there's no lesion that we can see, but we know that there's something functionally wrong in, a, in an area. So for those kinds of patients, the standard of care would be um, to place an array, a sheet uh, of electrodes down. And, and these are similar to the scalp electrode, just much smaller and condensed and 
and put into an actual numbered grid so we can actually make a map of the brain. Um, and these are the kinds of maps we can generate. So a patient will come to the operating room on a Monday, um, have these uh, sheets of electrodes placed, and we will spend Monday night all the way, usually till Friday, mapping and acquiring information. Mapping good and bad brain. So we want to know where the bad brain is. We're listening for seizures. And so this is an example in this red area here where the patient was buzzing or having seizure activity. Uh, and then we will also look for good brain. So here's an example of where we, when we stimulated these electrodes, we elicited aphasia. We mapped the patient's frontal eye fields to these electrodes. This is motor cortex. So it, it, even though it, structurally looking at the brain, nothing is just jumping out at us. We now have the advantage of, of actually creating a very detailed map with this grid array. So uh, this is if you have a situation where you have a pretty good sense regionally, um, low bar where the seizures are coming from. But let's take a step back. Let's say we don't even have that information. Let's say we, we're not even sure which side of the brain um, the, the seizures are coming from. Uh, when I first, first started um, on staff, we were still employing a technique where we would create burr holes. And on these x-rays, you can, you can sort of make out the silhouette of where these burr holes are. And think of it like ice fishing. You know, you, you're standing in the ice and you make this hole and you deploy these fishing lines. You don't know where they're going. They're just in the surface. So it's just two dimensional information. It does, tells you nothing about the depth of what you're listening to. And, and you have no idea which, which gyri, individual uh, gyri this, the seizures are coming from. And you're just deploying them. Um, and then from this, we, we may then convert it to a grid and so on and so forth. So, this left a lot to be desired. And, and I can tell you that we are far beyond this now and completely abandoned this kind of fishing expedition. Um, we are still fishing in regards, but we're using a much more sophisticated technique. So let me tell you a little bit about a technique called stereo electroencephalography. So this is a cartoon for a publication we're going to be submitting soon that shows how these very thin electrodes are strategically placed with stereotaxis. We're spending a lot of time before surgery studying their anatomy in three dimensions to th cleanly thread these electrodes down into anatomy. So now we are not just putting them on the surface. We are very strategically and purposefully placing these exactly where we want these into areas of interest. So um, these are very, very fine electrodes that are inserted through twist drill holes. There's no craniotomy. There's not even a burr hole. It's just a twist drill hole thick enough to get these electrodes in. Because they are so less invasive, the patients um, recover much more quickly. It's much less painful. It's basically a needle stick. It's like an IV hole. Um, it, there's a lot of precision because we are studying all their scans ahead of time and we're using coordinates to insert these electrodes. It allows us access to not only deeper structures, um, uh, but multiple lobes at the same time and actually both hemispheres at the same time. And it provides three dimensional electrophysiologic data. So, um, we use a technique that is frameless. There are some centers that actually place a frame on the head to insert them. Um, thankfully, because then I, I like to think because we spend so much time studying the pre-insertion angiography, both our infection and our hemorrhage risks are exceedingly low. Um, this is an example of what stereo EEG looks like. So on the left is a two-dimensional slice, a representative slice of a patient who had a, a perinatal infarct. You can see the encephalomalacia here. And, this, and all of the first tier and second tier work that we did suggested that this area around the encephalomalacia was involved. Um, and there's also occasional buzzes elsewhere. Um, so this is an example of, of, de of a deployment, an array of electrodes, but um, it still leaves a little bit to be desired because it's 2D. This doesn't give you a sense of where exactly am I depth-wise, anterior, posterior, inferior. So it's nice to be able to convert these two-dimensional slices into a three-dimensional model. So on the right-hand side, we've got all the electrodes. Somewhere in here is this encephalomalacia, but we're threading the needle between all the blood vessels that this image is going to show us, but we're also threading the needle between things like the motor tracts. You can see the orange tractography here, the patient's visual fibers, so the yellow uh, um, is here, is optic radiations, um, and you got, you're starting to see some more three-dimensional depth to this. So this is, this is very, very helpful. This is the patient in the operating room. So um, I can use this wand to neuro navigate where each of the entry points are. So again, no big incision. I'm just going to shave a little bit of hair enough that I can see where I'm going in. And I'm going to um, prep out all the little areas where each of these little um, electrodes are going to go. And this is an example of all the electrodes in place. They look like little Frankenstein bolts. Um, and they're, they're literally screwed. They have threads in them. They're screwed into place and held into place. 
And for the same kind of time frame of a Monday to Friday monitoring or Monday to Thursday or Monday to Wednesday, however long it takes, we are in this fishing boat hoping to catch some fish. Okay, so um, it's not just about advancing the field in a minimally invasive way to listen and diagnose where the seizure is coming from. Um, it's also about can we use minimally invasive techniques to treat seizures? And so this is some cover artwork that uh, we had from a couple years ago, where we use a, a technique to deploy a laser down to a deep-seated seizure focus called a hypothalamic hamartoma. Um, so this is an example of a hypothalamic hamartoma. And, and if you've ever cared for a patient with a hypothalamic hamartoma, you, you may have uh, read or, or seen your subgelastic seizure where it's like a little laughing or, or inappropriate um, gesturing. Um, and they can have developmental delays and behavioral issues, um, precocious puberty. Um, so this is, this is a problem. This is a three-dimensional challenge. You can see if you treat the head like a bowling ball, this thing is right in the center of the bowling ball. So there's all this good stuff all around it. And as, as a surgeon, um, it's not easy to get to this location because you may cause harm on the way in, either by uh, lifting and elevating other anatomy to get there or actually having to traverse through anatomy to get there. Um, and even then, as you get further and further into the brain, you are working down a more and more narrow corridor. And it's one thing to have a no narrow corridor to get the job done, but what about those little um, bleeding episodes that you might run into? It's really hard to see and control problems, surprises in really narrow, deep holes. Um, so this is an ideal situation if we had a minimally invasive technique to float something down um, and treat it from within. So let's talk a little bit about um, laser ablation. So uh, what we often will do is place some kind of head frame on the patient to create a coordinate system for the head. Um, we use a scalp mounted one that doesn't involve the whole head. Um, and we will take MRI images to help uh, generate these coordinates and through the coordinate system deploy um, through a twist drill hole uh, both a bolt to hold down the laser and the laser itself. In the MRI scanner, we will then heat the tip of the laser and from within burn the seizure focus. Um, after that, we'll uh, create, take another picture with some gadolinium to see how well we did and then the head frame is removed. So this is an example of what these things look like once they're placed. Again, vastly different than images of patients with big craniotomies and large scars and lots of pain. This is a little little um, uh, pinhole in the skin. We didn't even, didn't even shave uh, some of these patients for where we placed these bolts. Um, this is an example of what the laser will look like on its way down. And we actually will take images on the way down just in case we are not happy with the, the way it's deflecting or maybe it's not going exactly the way we thought it might. We have the ability with the, with the system that we use on the fly to adjust our trajectory so that we always hit the mark. Um, so at the end of this wire is the laser. Here's our hammer toma. We can assign thermal safeguards because if you think about it, this thing is gonna start to cook. But we don't wanna cook the important anatomy around. We only wanna ablate our target. So we can assign, and they're represented by these X's here, we can assign thermal safeguards to important structures like the optic tracts. Uh, the hypothalamus itself, the neighboring brainstem, whichever structures you care most about, you can deploy these thermal safeguards so that in real time, MR thermography is measuring the temperature here. And if any of those thermal safeguards trigger, the laser turns off so that we will not inadvertently be burning or apl uh, applying heat to, uh, to neighboring structures so we can keep them safe. In the meantime, the software is calculating um, for the amount of ablation and heat that you are deploying for this amount of time, this is the estimated area of ablated tissue. This is the burn. This is how much you're actually melting. So this is a, 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 an estimate of it. Um, this is a sped up video feed of both the thermography, the heat map in this middle column here, and then the estimated yellow ablation in the right. And these patients do exceedingly well. They're usually in the hospital for 24, 48 hours. Um, and it's, it's just so incredibly different than how we were treating these when I, even when I first started in 2008, where we would basically do craniotomies and those patients would stay in house for quite some time. And, um, and you don't necessarily get the job done um, because it's, it's a really hard, technically hard uh, corridor to be operating in. So we really like this new minimally invasive approach to deep seated lesions like this that are discrete. 
Um, you need to see what you're going after. This is not ideal for something for someone who's non-lesional. If you don't know what you're going after, you can't design an ablation field for it. So this is this is for a very specific subset of patients. Okay, so um, moving on with additional advances. So we've talked a little bit about how we are using state-of-the-art imaging um, to, to answer the question where. We talked a little bit about how we are using minimally invasive techniques to not only diagnose seizures with stereo EEG, but ablate them with laser. Um, what about devices? What about machine brain or machine central nervous system interfaces? Um, uh, can we potentially use that kind of technology to um, not necessarily uh, ablate or resect tissue, but just leave that tissue in place and modulate it, get it to work the way we want it to be, to be working. So the first um, I'll talk about is, is a vagal nerve uh, stimulator, which is, is, it's been in place for, for quite some time. This is some of our work uh, published a, a few years ago now uh, for VNSs and kids. Um, it's a device that as the cartoon shows, uh, sits, excuse me, sits in the chest wall. As, so there's one incision in the chest wall. There's a smaller incision in a, a skin fold of the neck where the vagus nerve lives. And under a microscope um, or under loops, we thread the electrode coils around the vagus nerve and plug it into this device. It's not exactly clear um, how the mechanism works for how, how this, this uh, device controls epilepsy, but the way I explain it to families is basically in this way. Um, an epileptic brain is a chaotic environment. Um, and what this device is, is it provides a rhythm. It's basically a drumbeat, a pattern. At, at, a, at predetermined intervals, it will provide a stimulus and it provides a pattern. Little by little, this chaotic environment starts to hear that drum beat. And one by one, these neuronal circuits start to march to the beat of the drum. And instead of doing their chaotic thing, would rather march to the beat of the drum and, and be organized than to do their chaotic thing. That's the best way I can describe how the, the first function of a VNS is. Um, it's just synchronizing a chaotic environment. It's just doing its drum beat thing though. It's not, it's not listening for seizures in that regard. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a seizure detector in that way. Um, it's just a drum beat, a drum machine. Um, the oldest devices um, lasted six to eight years, but they've become more and more sophisticated. And I wanna tell you how that's, that's, that's been changing. And as the sophisticated functions are increasing, more battery drain is happening. So the, the battery life initially we would say six to eight years. I'm more saying it's more four to six years. I've had patients who would only last a couple of years um, if they are requiring very high settings. But um, in, 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 in uh, exchange for just getting two years of, of battery life, you're still hopefully getting um, a seizure control, better seizure control. So let me talk about how this device has gotten a little bit more sophisticated. So the, the latest model, the model 1000 of the VNS, um, it will provide its, its uh, interictal stimulation, this drum beat, but it also has a heart rate triggered stimulus. So when patients get VNSs, they're sent home with a little magnet. And if they're seizing through their, their device, they can swipe across the device and give a little extra kick, a little stimulus. Well, this device will use the heart rate as a surrogate for um, a precursor of a seizure. It, it's an alert that a seizure is about to happen. What the company determined is that about 83% of patients who are about to have a big seizure will have a statistically significant jump in their heart rate before that big seizure happens. So what the device is using is that heart rate jump as a surrogate for uh, a seizure alarm. So it's sitting right here. It's sitting almost like where um, a stethoscope would sit when you listen to the heart. So it's in a very good, um, ideally situated place to listen to that heart rate. And when it detects a statistically significant ju um, jump in the heart rate, it will give that stimulus, that magnetic swipe um, automatically. And it's happening in the background and it's, it's doing it um, without the patient or the family having to do anything. And you can adjust the sensitivity. Um, so it might take quite a lot of, of uh, uh, to, to make it give the stimulus or it could be very, very easy to, to stimulate. Um, so um, it, in addition to having the drum beat built in, it also has this heart rate um, sensor. Um, you can pre-program it so that you can, because um, these patients do have to come in to get it uh, reprogrammed to go to the next level of uh, frequency and stimulation. You can tell it to get to the next level automatically, and it's 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 finite how many pre-programs you can put in. And 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 truthfully, we wouldn't want a, a patient out there just floating uh, without some kind of regular check-in. But it's nice and convenient for families, especially those who live far away and don't have an epilepsy center nearby, to build in some uh, pre-programmed uh, uh, changes so that they don't have to come all the way down to campus. Um, one more thing that is, is, is on standby in the device is a prone alert. Uh, much the same way our, our, our cell phones now have a positional sensor in it, um, this device can sense 
um, A, when a patient's having a seizure, and B, when they're prone. So um, this, this, is not a, this device uh, function has not gone live, um, but the prone alert uh, functionality um, will alert uh, at least, I think, a couple of caregivers to uh, the fact that this patient is prone and having a seizure. Um, I th and I think, I believe by, by text message. So um, it's not go live yet, but it's one more um, added layer of security and safety and, and reassurance um, that uh, I, hope, I hope we will all have access to. But this is what the newest model um, of the VNS provides. Okay, we, we spent a little bit of time kind of surveying the field of, you know, how, how do all patients respond to the VNS? This is our own meta-analysis from a few years ago. Um, and I, I pointed out a couple of things. On average, we in this meta-analysis of all comers, um, we found a 45% uh, rate of reduction of seizures. There was significant uh, benefit, and this is pertinent to us in our pediatric practice, of children over adults um, who have generalized epilepsy. And um, there's actually a, a, a positive predictor of a favorable outcome for patients who have tuberous sclerosis complex. And, and you know, for those of us who take care of kids and, and who manage pediatric epilepsy, we do manage a lot of tuberous TS patients. Um, so this, this is a favorable device for kids and, and, and for, all, for all patients who are not candidates for other forms of therapy. Um, it's important though, and we counsel families, and we're very, very transparent about this, that it's very rare to achieve seizure freedom with this device. Um, and we, we definitely try not to just to sell this device in that way. It's, it's sort of, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a last resort, but it's, it's definitely something that we would only recommend if we didn't have other more proven, uh, more efficacious uh, treatments. About a quarter of patients uh, received no benefit. Um, when I first started implanting these, um, just because of this is, this is how I was um, taught in training, um, we, uh, we would tell patients, you know, once it's in, it's just, it's in, it's not coming out. It's just too much scar on, on the vagus nerve. And the, the battery comes out pretty easily. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I've actually found that it, with the right amount of time and the right technique, we were actually able to get everything out. Um, so I no longer tell patients that once it's in, it stays in. Um, we, we have the ability to take these devices out if, if need be. Okay, so um, that was the VNS. And I like the VNS because um, it, it's, it's sort of a grab bag and, and, and it, it, it can treat a lot of different patients, um, but uh, it's, it's, it's not a very super smart device. It's not an ideal device where it's, it's waiting and watching. It's not a, it's not a seizure pol a police officer. You know, it's not policing seizures. Um, now talk about the device uh, called a responsive neurostimulator. And, and we are talking now about a more sophisticated device. Um, it is a device that truly is waiting and watching and listening for seizure activity. Um, so what an RNS is, it's, it's a device that can be attached to up to two electrodes and you choose whether that's going to be two strip electrodes or two depth electrodes or a combination, but you're only given two ports to plug into. Um, sometimes in, in really complex cases, what we have done is, is actually implant more than two electrodes, but the highest yield ones will be the ones that we plug in and ones that may become players down the road, we implant but don't plug in, but we put them close to an area of the incision that if we need to, we can you know, just unplug and, and, and replug. Um, so you have up to two ports. It's meant for patients who've failed more than two meds, who've got greater than three seizures per month and have at most one to maybe two seizure foci. More than that, again, you're limited by the number of, of, of ports. The first studies showed that about, there was a 21% reduction in seizures compared to the control group. And this is an illustration of what, what an EEG will look like where a patient is chugging along and having a spontaneous seizure. The device detects it, it provides an electrical stimulation, and effectively, it's doing this. Stop that. And it gives that stimulus and interrupts that, that pattern, that, that, that circuit, and uh, the seizure stops. So that's what this, the RNS is doing in the background. You have to know where the seizures are coming from. Um, it tends to be um, devoted for, to patients who have tissue that cannot be resected. And a perfect example, their seizure focus is in speech cortex or in hand motor cortex, just some area of brain that the stakes are too high to remove that brain. So this is an example of the devices as it's sitting in my hand. Um, uh, further studies and, and longer term um, uh, uh, data showed that um, this next wave of the study showed that there was a 38% reduction in seizures with neuropace now compared to the sham population. And if you follow these patients over time, that number jumps from 38 to 44% at the one year mark. And then it 
will improve from 44 to 53% at the two year mark and without any adverse effects on neuropsych or, or mood. So it's, an, it's, some, it's a learning device. And, and what we're seeing, we think, is that you get in, improvement over time um, and, and increasing returns as the device stays in. Okay. So uh, with the time remains, I, I, I do want to share now um, something that, um, uh, that started um, for my practice um, at a <laughs> with a trip to uh, uh, a mall. Um, so it was Christmas time, and I, had, I was taking my nieces um, shopping uh, for, for their Christmas presents. And as a reward for, <laughs> for uh, purchasing $200 uh, worth of jeans, um, the cashier gave me this box. He said, congratulations, sir. You've spent $200 on jeans. And so your reward is this. And, and they gave me this box. And what it was is uh, it's, a, it's a, a virtual reality headset that holds your phone. So it just basically converts your, your phone um, into a headset um, and you wear it. And, and I'm thinking, you know, um, wow, if, if virtual reality is good enough for Forever 21, um, then it's, it's got to be good enough for my pediatric epilepsy surgery practice. And so this is 2017. And um, lo and behold, um, virtual reality is taking hold in, in multiple different arenas. So it's, it's blown up in the gaming industry, um, in, re in, in retail, um, obviously, as you can see. Um, so there is a system that's available for surgeons. And it's the, the device first was released in the adult population and slowly has migrated to the pediatric population. And it was uh, basically portrayed as an, a tool to help surgeons three-dimensionalize, visualize two-dimensional problems in 3D, and not just that, but immerse yourself into that virtual environment. So this is a, a, some imaging from our operating room. This is one of our residents wearing uh, one of our headsets, and he is actually virtually the size of a mosquito right now, and he's using these hand controllers to fly down into the anatomy and look around at, at the, uh, the case coming up. And in, it's, it's shocking the kinds, uh, first of all, the fidelity of what you see, uh, that it is true to form. You know, what you see in 3D on these models is a very vivid three-dimensional reconstruction of what you see and scroll through in 2D, that's first of all. But you are shown vantage points that are impossible using standard two-dimensional formats. So we, we've had a lot of um, uh, good success prepping and preparing for complex anatom anatomical um, challenges for complex surgeries pre-op. As you can see, we bring it to the operating room on, on tough cases to do um, periodic check-ins to, 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 to monitor where we are. It can be, it can be linked to our standard neuro navigation system. So the same wands that we're seeing to, um, that I showed you for neuro navigation are showing up on these virtual reality screens. Um, so we're, we were having a, a really positive experience as surgeons. So now fast forward to um, when I now introduce it to my patients, my pediatric patients. Um, and it's, it's, it's really, really helpful because I'm trying to visualize a, a three-dimensional problem off of two-dimensional slices. And even this three-dimensional model leaves something to be desired. Now take this example of trying to prepare for surgery, and I wanna show you what it looks like in VR. So um, we're gonna now take these images and I wanna show you each of these electrodes in VR. They're color-coded. Um, we're gonna be on the lookout, by the way, for any electrodes that might be problem electrodes, any electrodes that are tagging blood vessels. And so when you look at this, this fly through, um, I'll look at electrode number two, the red one. Um, while you're in there, look around and, and check out how the tractography looks from motor and, and vision and get a sense that you are truly a mosquito flying around inside this patient's uh, brain. So uh, this is uh, 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 the actual patient's face off of their um, MRI. We're going to give you some x-ray vision to look through the skin. So you're just seeing the brain tissue now. Each of these electrodes is colored, so you can tell which one's which. Take a look at that red one. As we fly down here, it looks like it might be tagging a vessel there. So that's an electrode that we're gonna have to adjust on the fly. But all the others look like they're nicely threading the needle between all these blood vessels, between all the tracks, um, really in getting a good sense of are we sampling all the cortices well, or do we have a really good representation of the, of the low bar anatomy? Um, it's, it's a very different view than if we were just scrolling through an axial CT. 
and then a coronal MRI, and then trying in our mind's eye to make this 3D model. Okay, so this is, you know, this is obviously really helpful for us, the surgeons, but when I started to share this with the patients, I was really, it was an eye-opening experience. So this is an example of me for the, what is one of my first um, experiences sharing it with one of my patients. I was showing her the tumor that was causing her epilepsy, causing her seizures. And I'm trying, I'd never done this before, and I'm trying to maintain my game face and my professionalism. And I'm, fl I'm flying her through this. And, and while I'm flying her down into her brain, Straight down to it. She and reaches actually. up and tries to grab, <laughs> to grab her tumor. It? Okay, um, and so here's this patient, this ten-year-old girl, and this is two days before her brain surgery, and she's smiling and she's laughing, and her parents are behind her and they're smiling and laughing, and the the the, the weight that was on their shoulders, and the more her their child laughed, started to lift, and it dawned on me that um, this is a a way to to potentially interact and connect with our patients. As, as pediatric subspecialists as we all are, it's really hard sometimes for us to, to establish that doctor-patient rapport. Because I, I walk in with the white coat and, it, and, it's, and they have no idea what they're here for and it's, it's frightening stuff. And we're talking in all these complex terms and we're showing all these pictures that make no sense. And you put these headsets on these kids. First of all, these are headsets they, they probably own themselves because a lot of them are gamers. They already know how to use these hand controllers. And it's a vivid, colorful experience that's immersive and interactive. And it basically is empowering them. It is, it is giving them a fuller understanding of why are they here and what has to happen. And I get to show them what's been causing their headaches, what's been causing their seizures, why they can't be like the other kids. And it gives them an opportunity to virtually reach out and grab that thing that's been causing their problems. Um, I, I, was, I was really, really moved by this, this interaction. So it led to a lot of questions I had about how far can we take this as a pediatric engagement tool? And so this is a, a picture of our youngest um, patient. How, how young can you go? This is a four-year-old. And you know, as you might imagine, a four-year-old is going to get very different things out of the experience than a 10-year-old might. But he was still having fun. You know, he was still seeing his own brain. He started to see his own face and fly through it. Um, and it was a very different um, clinic experience. And as you can see on the right, here's mom. So it brings up another question. Here I am taking these families through a guided tour of gray and white, um, black and white, two-dimensional slices that is not making entire sense to them. Left is right, right is left, which is up and which is down. And a lot of times I've noticed I will ask patients afterwards, okay, well, you know, do you have any questions? And they'll have this blank expression on their face and say, oh, no, I guess it's just fine. Um, and they're not fully understanding. It's when I quiz them that I realize they did, they don't really understand what's going on because it's too hard to follow. So here's mom wearing the headset. So is the kid. And it, it brings up this opportunity to do a different kind of tour, a different kind of experience where this is, this is a family. All of us are wearing headsets. All of us have hand controllers and we're literally taking a guided tour of this patient's brain. So I'm going to show you some, uh, this is some audio and video of one of our earliest uh, tours. And this is what it goes like. Mom, mom and dad see me? We're going all the way inside Jade's brain. Tell me when you get there. And you can see there are little avatars um, that represent mom, around. dad, me, the patient. Okay. They all are walking all right. around with so, me. So if you can actually fly past, hey dad, if you can actually fly past me um, and or get yourselves on either side of me so that I'm not blocking you, but there's something I want to show you. you. Even more, even more, I'm going to go away a little bit. Okay, and then Dad, can you look over your right shoulder, like all the way behind you? Keep, keep going, keep going, keep going. Can you see this arrow that I'm pointing up, all you guys? Yeah. So I'm pointing the tumor, but on top of the tumor, there's this blue like thing like shaped like an S. That's yet another blood vessel that's hiding on the other side of your tumor, meaning like it's actually hidden. Meaning if I went through your tumor, Jade, and I kept going, 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 eventually I'm going to hit this guy. That's my stop sign. So, um think of us uh, on, on a tour of a museum and I'm the tour guide and I start the tour by showing them some stuff and then at, after that's done they're free to roam around um, and it's it's so much richer of an experience to see all this stuff especially when you start with the child's face then fade into the problem it's it makes it much more real now what I'm showing you is one of the first fly-throughs that we did um, as you can see the, the avatars are very rudimentary now they're very gender and age specific and as you saw, we can label them. They know who they are and they're floating above their heads they, and they have their own controls. Um, 
And, you know, I do spend a little bit of time now ahead of time choreographing things a little bit more because I don't want to spend a whole lot of time asking dad to turn around, you know, waste clinic time doing that. So it's a much more streamlined process. There is a little bit of a learning curve. But I can tell you, um, kids are uh, enjoying this very frightening experience so much more with this kind of experience. Next question I had, and it'll be the last question I raised for this, for this, this new, this new uh, territory is, um, uh, how much are they actually retaining? You know, that was always a concern of mine. Is like, I'm showing them all these pictures and they don't really understand. Um, and so I decided for one of my kids, I'm gonna quiz him. I'm gonna show him some stuff and then I'm gonna quiz him and ask him to show me all the things I just taught him. So this is a, a video of, the, of that next kid. And he actually has not seizures, but an, an arterial venous malformation. So I ask, I'm quizzing him on his AVM. Able to point to your AVM now? There it is. And then can you point to that vessel that was feeding the, the AVM? Oh, it goes it's, it's, right next there it is. Oh, you got it. All right, now let's, let's, now let's, let's pull that AVM a little bit closer to us. And I want you to kind of rock it left and right and take a good look at it. Yeah. Uh, look at you. Oh, so good. Actually, and look to your left a little bit. There you go. Now it's right in the center of what we see. Good job, man. You are you're basically a brain surgeon. So I was really impressed. He nailed every single one of my questions. I, it was one fly through, and that includes a fly through of how do you use your hands to move these images. And it, it for these kids, it's just so intuitive. This is their world, and that's what I that's what I, I I came to realize. Here I was thinking I'm I'm some cool adult sharing this virtual world with them. We are visitors in that world to them. This is their world. This is their language. And so when you speak their language, you really are able to make this connection with them. And again, it, it, it very much empowers them. This is their AVM. This is their tumor. They're taking control of it. So I quizzed him and he nailed every single one of those answers. But I, I hope you actually also heard in the background, every single time I asked him a question, what you also heard was his six-year-old brother and his mom, who's who, by the way, English is her second language, fighting over who could answer the question first. So even though I was laser focused on my patient, is my patient getting it? Is the patient learning? They weren't even in headsets. They were just passers-by, standers-by, and, and, and they were learning and understanding and getting this information uh, alongside them as well. So it really showed how rich and powerful this, this tool was. So I, I, was, I'm, I want to be very, very sensitive to time so that if there's any questions, I want to be able to answer them. Um, I, just to summarize, um, I hope you saw that um, as we are trying to answer the question of where, we're trying to localize where these users are coming from, it's really a synthesis of all these different multiple kinds of modalities and techniques. We are becoming more sophisticated and more minimally invasive to achieve, achieve more with less to both find these seizures and diagnose them with something like stereo EG and treat them with things like laser ablation. Um, we are trying to develop devices better so that we don't just go in there and ablate or resect tissue. We are modulating the tissue that's already in there and doing uh, less damage that way. And then I do hope I showed you that with some of these advanced imaging techniques, and we just talked about virtual reality. The next phase is what's going to, it's called augmented reality, where those holograms that I showed you are going to be superimposed on the patient's anatomy in my microscope on my heads up display. So I'm gonna be able to effectively have like x-ray vision as I'm moving my microscope around, even though I'm looking at an intact brain, I can see the safest and quickest way down to my target. So AR, augmented reality is the next uh, stage of the game, but it's enhancing how I'm planning, it's ha enhancing how I'm teaching, and it's ex ex an exceptional tool for communicating complex um, relationships and anatomy and, and, and terms to, to patients and families who otherwise don't have a medical background and, and otherwise wouldn't understand it with the old, the older ways. So uh, with that, I'll, I will say thank you, especially, especially to all the men and women who are part of our greater epilepsy team. I'm just, I'm just the, the surgeon, um, and uh, this is the collection of people on both campuses, both sides of the bay, who work very, very hard um, to get these patients all the way from the front door uh, to the operating room and then home. Um, so I you know, obviously couldn't do any of it without any of all their help. So um, I'm, I really thank, uh, thank all of them as well. Um, so with that, I'll uh, um, answer any questions you guys have. Wow, um, Dr. Augusta, that was incredibly cool. Um, so, so fun to see all these new uh, techniques. Um, we're opening it up for questions. People who have questions, please type them in the Q&A in the, in the webinar function at the bottom of your screen. Um, 
maybe I'll start with a question as we're waiting for people to pose, compose theirs. Um, I was wondering about the uh, the device that responds to a jump in heart rate. Um, like, I, I know, actually, I realize how little I know about deep brain stimulators, but if the b deep brain stimulator fires, is a patient aware of that? And if so, because I was thinking about, you know, the automatic uh, defibrillator devices for yeah. people with yeah, heart um I, I can say that at some of the highest settings, um, some patients will report feeling something. Um, and it, it's, it's variable. It, it's, thankfully, it's, it's not typically like a shock. They're not like being jolted. Um, it's, uh, but it's, there's so many um, efferents that go to like the back of the throat, and the vocal cords and all those things. Um, so they can feel sensations like funny tickling and sensations back there. It, thankfully, it tends to be at higher settings. Some patients are going to be a little bit more sensitive than others, but that's where you your adjustment of the of the the settings and the parameters and the sensitivity of the stim really comes into play. Um, so there's a lot of degrees of freedom here, and um, it's it's a very very well tolerated device. And and in the hundreds that I've implanted, thankfully not once has it been a situation where um, a patient is actually so disturbed and and so irritated. By, st by stimuli or stimulation that we have to st either stop the device or take the device out. I I'm fa thankfully, I'm thankful that that's never been the case. There was one interesting case of, um, there was one of our patients who was a teen and she was a singer. And um, because uh, the vagus nerve does innervate in, in part the, the vocal cords, um, it, when she was trying to sing and hit the highest notes, um, the device actually impeded her ability to get to those highest notes. And so there was a period of time where we had to strategically bring her in, um, downgrade her settings, get her to perform and hit those notes, um, and then she'd come back in, and then we would restore her, her settings. Um, uh, so that, that, that's an interesting twist. Um, but thankfully, uh, I've, I've not personally seen or, or, or experienced in our patient population the, the, the extreme where it's really it's painful or irritating or anything like that, thankfully. Thankfully. Thank you. Um, I don't see any questions coming in, so I'm just going to keep on going because I have another one that uh, has also to do with the patient experience. Um, I It was really nice to see uh, the patient response to the virtual um, simulator experience. I can also imagine that it might be very frightening for some people. Are there limitations yeah. to the types of patients who are... Um, uh, responsive to this, and how do you do it with patients who do not have English as their first language? Yeah, so um, all, all excellent questions. The first thing is that um, to address the, the uh, concern of this actually might do the opposite. It, it actually is going to totally freak them out and, and, and make them more scared. Um, it tends to be a self-selecting population, um, and, and it's, it's overwhelmingly not the case. So many of these kids are gamers. It's shocking, you know, it's shocking, especially now, I haven't been doing any patient engagement during COVID, but I imagine that there's many more immersive headsets sitting in houses now. Um, but these kids, they come in, they put on these headsets and they are, I, I have to stop them and say, can you just, can you show me what you just did? You know, um, I'm supposed to be the expert in this and they're, they're showing me. Um, but for the ones who are, you know, ah, you know, this is really kind of frightening me, whether it's a parent or a kid, they self-select. I mean, and we don't, we in no way, force this on anyone. It's actually in a separate room. We usually start in, in one room and I, I do the introductions and get some of the preliminary stuff out of the way. And then I offer it, I offer it as an op opportunity or an option. Did, did you want, you know, we're all done with the business end of things. Did you want to see it now, you know, in, in a more color? Or in, so then when you see it, um, the nice thing is that I'm not showing pictures of bloody, you know, you know, gory brain. Um, you saw it. It's, it's all, it's cartoons. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of, fa it's a fantasy world. It's, it's not quite so real. Um, and uh, I, I think it, it, it takes away a lot of the fear, you know, with that. Um, so that's, that's in our favor. Um, and then I, I, I was the last, that the last question you had about? Um, uh, people for whom the English is not their first language. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we continue to have the interpreter services as part of this experience. Um, but it's, it's I, I will say it's, it's a lot harder to say, do, do you see that on a 2D slice, then there's a giant red ball where the tumor should be um, in VR. Um, and and, when I, and I've, I've, 
I've borne this out in, in actually testing in Spanish as well. I'm, I'm, I'm bilingual. So I, I, can, I can ask them in the same way I would an English speaker if they're actually retaining and understanding. And it's, I just use so many fewer words, period. Um, whether that's, those are in, words in English or words in Spanish. And I have to think that the same will hold true for all our other multilingual families, um, that you just, because it's a visual tool, um, you know, the, the picture's worth a thousand words. So it's, it's just, you, you just achieve so much more illustrating it than you are trying to elaborate it. Um, and, and sometimes even with the best interpreters, we fall short in finding the right words to explain what we're, where, where is this exactly? You know, um, I, I, I'm, I'm appalled, you know, when I have a, a, a non-English speaker and I, I, I say, all right, can you just point to where you think the, your child's tumor is? And they're, you know, it's completely wrong, you know? Um, so we just have to do better. And um, I, I think time will show that, that this helps, this helps. Great. Um, well, thank you again very, very much. Uh, I thought this was a fantastic talk. Loved all the images and videos. Um, it, it doesn't look like there are any other questions. So I am going to ask Dr. Hirsch to uh, close off uh, Grand Rounds. But before I ask him to do that, I just want to make sure people know we have a whole schedule lined up for the rest um, of the fall. Uh, next week, we actually have a physician parent uh, talking about her experience with uh, a critically ill child, her, her own critically ill child who passed away. And then the week after, uh, on October 8th, we have a um, uh, co-sponsored Grand Rounds with the BCH DEI uh, curriculum where one of our PLUS residents is coming to talk about affirmative action. So two, two other very different topics, but hopefully very exciting topics uh, coming up. Okay, thank you, Sandrine. And uh, Curtis, that was absolutely fabulous. Uh, and so, so exciting how that technology is evolving. And I just want to congratulate you and your team on, on that amazing work that you're doing. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, another great Grand Rounds, and we'll see you all uh, next week. Have a good rest of your week. Bye-bye.